There's a lot of films, aren't there, where there's only one way for the people to be saved. There's only one person that can save the day. And the film is all about that one person, or maybe even the series of films, is all about that one person growing into the role of saving the day. As I was trying to, trying to think about who films which give us an example of this, that here's a couple of examples that I thought of. Some of them are oldies, so bear with me. Um, only Harry Potter can defeat Voldemort. Only Iron Man can defeat Thanos. Only Bruce Willis can save the world from being destroyed by a giant meteorite hurtling towards them. Do you remember Armageddon? It's quite old now, but it happened. In the Terminator films, only John Connor can defeat Skynet. In Interstellar, only Captain Cooper is the one who can find the key to the black hole and transmit it back in time in order to save the whole human race. You've got to watch the film to understand that reference. In Lord of the Rings, as Josh was talking about The Hobbit before, in in The Hobbit, Bilbo is the only person who can break into the dragon's lair. And in Lord of the Rings, Frodo is the only person who can take the ring and destroy it. There's only one way to be saved. And in this passage today, we're going to see that for God's people, there is only one way that they can be saved. And before we get to that one way, we're going to see three points. So this is where we're going today. The first thing is we're going to see their sin, which is rebellion. The second thing we're going to see is God's judgment. And the third thing we're going to see is the hope. Let's get into the passage now. So, the sin of rebellion. I don't know if you realize there were, there were two distinct groups. We, we saw that, that came up in, uh, in Sam and Lucy's uh, All Age slot that it did for us. There was Korah, and there was a, a group that involved, uh, or that was led by Dathan and Abiram. But they had kind of slightly different motives in coming to Moses and, and rebelling against Moses. First, there was, there was Korah. Now, he was a a Levite, and he actually had the second most important job in the whole of the nation. The job of this particular group of Levites was to carry the most sacred objects from the tabernacle from one place to another. These guys were a big deal. They they had a very important job. But Korah and and his followers, they aren't satisfied They really want the top job. They want to be the priests. They want to be the ones who come and bring the offering to God. And see what Korah says in verse 3? He says, you've gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. And in some senses, what Korah says here is true. It's right because God has said they are his holy people. Yet what Korah does here is he takes the truth. He takes one thing that God has said and he stretches it just a little bit too far. So it ends up meaning something completely different to what God meant when he said it. And that is what false teaching is. False teaching is where you take a truth from the Bible, a truth that God has spoken, and you stretch it until it means something else. So that's the first group of rebels, Korah. The second group was Dathan and Abiram, and we see them in, in verses 12 to 14. Now, they have a different gripe. Their complaint is basically, oh, Moses, life is hard here living in the wilderness. We don't like it. You said that we were going to a land flowing with milk and honey, but here we are in the desert. This isn't what we signed up for. We want to go back to Back to Egypt. Life was better in Egypt. That's the land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, when you think about what the Israelites were actually going through in Egypt, the slavery that they were in there, they have a very bad case of the grass is greener on the other side. They're not willing to go through the wilderness, to go through difficulties in order to reach God's promised land. So we've got two different groups of rebels here. We've got those who want more authority and those who are rebelling because their lives are hard. And as we see, these people aren't just rebelling against Moses and Aaron. They're not just, they're not just uh, going against those who are in authority. Actually, they're going against God. God. 
Now, we didn't read chapter 17, but in chapter 17, verse 5, God says, I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against me. You see, when the people come and complain against Moses and Aaron, God says they're not just complaining against you, they're complaining against me. Rebelling against God's anointed rescuer is rebelling against God himself. Now, Jesus takes this concept and applies it to himself. It's one of the many ways that we see in the gospel where Jesus sets himself as God. So just after uh, chapter 3, verse 16, which is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, in chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus says this. This is in John. Whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Jesus stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus here is saying, I am God's rescuer. I am God's anointed king. How you treat me is how you treat God the Father. And this, this is the essence of sin. The essence of sin is rejecting God's rescuer, rejecting God's king, and seeking to place ourselves as the king in our own lives. Now, just before we move on to look at God's judgment, there's a, uh, there's a thing in this passage that I, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about, and it's about grumbling. Now, I want to split this down into, into three things. I'm going to tell you two things that the Bible says is okay, and one thing that the Bible says is not okay. So they are lament, whistleblowing, and grumbling. So lament and whistleblowing are okay. Grumbling is not okay. Let me get, get into those a bit more. So what the Bible is not saying here, what this passage is not saying, is that we can't talk about difficulties in our lives. Actually, through the Bible, there are many, many occasions where godly men and women pray and sing about the difficulties that they are going through, about their trials and their troubles. There's even a type of writing in the Bible called lament. There's an entire book called Lamentations. Lament is where these struggling God followers bring to him their trials and their troubles, their doubts and their hurts. They bring them to God and ask him to change them. They talk openly and honestly with God about their faith, places where it is strong, but also places where their faith is weak, ways in which they have sinned and ways in which they want to turn back to God. In, in lamenting, people acknowledge God's control and God's power, and they ask for a greater understanding to see that. And this form of talking about our trials is perfectly legitimate and even encouraged in the Bible. Now, that's the first thing. So it's okay to talk about your troubles. The second thing is, it's okay to challenge leaders over ungodly behavior behavior. The Bible is clear that there is a standard of living that the Lord expects from us. And where people don't uh, reach that standard of living, God is right to judge. And we should be willing to hold people to account. In Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, God talks about uh, people, uh, people who are called shepherds. So people who are called to look after the people they use people for their own gain and their own comfort instead of sacrificing their own desires for the sake of the flock. And the Bible says that God is against those types of leaders and God will rescue his people from those bad leaders. Indeed, we see how leaders who go against God's way and refuse to repent and refuse to follow his ways, they are judged. If you'd like some examples of that, just go and read through the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And there are plenty of examples of God's leaders who don't follow his ways and are judged for that. Leaders in the church as well are not above what God says in his word. And it is right to expect 
godly conduct from those who are in authority over the church. And it is right to challenge those leaders according to what the Bible says if their conduct does not match up to what God's word says. So those two things are okay. It is okay to lament, lament, and it is okay to challenge leaders over ungodly behavior. But grumbling, what is grumbling? That is the sin that the people were committing here, but what does it actually involve? Well, they're going through difficulties and hard times, but the way that they respond is instead of bringing their their trials and their difficulties to God... They, uh, they talk to others and they seek to blame other people for their difficulties. Instead of acknowledging their own sin in the situation, they look around for people to pin it on. You know, these, these people in this passage, um, so one thing that you don't necessarily notice as, as you just read it as is, is that actually the Korahites and the Reubenites, which were what the other tribe were from, they're actually next door neighbors. They both camp on the south side of the tabernacle. I don't know if you remember the sermon that I preached a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at how the camp was laid out. And these guys are on the, the south side together. And what they've done is they found other people who also have complaints against uh, their leaders and they've built themselves an echo chamber so they keep talking around their grumbles and they're only confirmed in in the problems that they have so instead of being challenged about their sins they end up looking for people to blame for their own unhappiness and the people that they blame are Moses and Aaron But as these are God's anointed leaders, as we've seen, their gripe is not really with Moses and Aaron. Their gripe is actually with God. And that's certainly how God sees it. And this, as we'll see in a little while, is what brings God's judgment on the people. Now, we're all going through difficulties right now, aren't we? And we've all gone through difficulties in the last year. And and I'm sure there are many other things that have happened in our lives and will happen in our lives as we go through this particular wilderness period right now but also other times of wilderness in our lives and as we go through this desert let's be aware of our own sufferings and our own difficulties and let's also be aware of those of others let's be active in bringing those things to God first and foremost in seeking to confess our sins And be aware that we need to show grace to one another at this time. Let's lament instead of grumble. Okay, so the the second thing, big thing that we see in this passage is about judgment. We see how God judges those who rebel against him. But just before we get into that, I want to look at verse 6 here. Uh, So in verse 6, you, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers, and verse 7, tomorrow morning put burning coals and incense in them before the Lord. Moses gives the rebels 24 hours before he sets the challenge. He doesn't just lay down the gauntlet right there and then say, come on, let's go. He says, no, come back tomorrow, and if you're still unhappy, this is what we'll do. Moses gives them time to repent. And also the the test that he gives them, this is a significant test, bringing the censors, because it's not, it's not, this is just some random thing that Moses has plucked out of his mind. Bringing censors of incense from the altar before the Lord was the job of the priest. It was one of the main things that the priest did uh, to to bring uh, an aroma pleasing to the Lord, as Andy was explaining to us last week. It's how the people's sin was atoned for. Basically, what Moses is challenging Korah and his followers to is he's saying, come on then, if you want to be priest, let's have a priesting contest here. Let's see who's the better priest is. It's like somebody going to Usain Bolt and saying, hey, you know, I'm a faster runner than you. And and Usain Bolt saying, all right, well, let's run 100 meters together. Let's see who is faster because the proof is in the pudding. But we see here, as the passage goes on, that it's Moses and Aaron who are proved right because God judges and kills the rebels of the, 
the rebels and their families and 250 of the Levites. This passage shows us that it is a very, very serious thing to reject God's rescuer and his priest and to rebel against what he said. Now, one of the particularly difficult parts of this passage uh, that that I've been uh, thinking about is it's not just the rebels themselves who are punished, but also their families too. And this, this is a very difficult thing for us to come to terms with. Whilst we can, we can pretty much justify the punishment of the, of the rebels, it's hard to stomach the punishment, as, as Moses writes here, the wives, the children, and the little ones. But we see something of the seriousness of sin here, the seriousness of rebelling against God. Because I don't know about you, but when we sin, we often think, oh, it's, it's, just, it's just one little thing. It's, it's not really hurting anyone. But actually, sin has consequences for us and for those around us, for, our, for those who we love, for our families. Sin has consequences in our communities. And in this case, the punishment goes beyond the individual. But more often, the impacts are not just in the punishment, but also the sin itself, which can negatively impact lots of people around us. And this punishment of sin here, this judgment that God gives, is so, uh, so final that we should sit up and take notice. We should realize that God is holy And he must be treated seriously, taken seriously, and treated with respect. We we so easily forget that, don't we? You know, we minimize our sin. And as we minimize our sin and say, oh, it's it's not that serious. It's not that much of a big deal. As we do that, we minimize God's holiness and say, well, God's, God's not really that holy. God doesn't really mind about it. But one thing that this passage does is it reminds us that our sin is serious. Our sin has consequences and we cannot mess around with it. There was a a news article this week, wasn't there? Dominic Cummings was uh, answering questions before MPs. And one of the things he said was that back in early 2020... Nobody really thought that this COVID-19 was particularly serious. They kind of thought that it would, it would blow over. They didn't take it seriously. And because of that, as we know, it had disastrous consequences and still is. God judges those who rebel against his leaders. But the third thing we see in this passage is hope. You know, if God is the judge and is poised to judge the rebellious people, what hope is there? Well, to be honest, for for us, as as the everyday people, there, there is no hope because the people don't do anything right in the story. They rebel, they grumble, they run away scared. That's all the people do. The hope isn't in the people. But there are some little hints here which point us to something greater Let's look at verse 22. In verse 22, uh, Moses and Aaron fall face down and cry out, Oh God, the God who gives breath to all living things, will you be angry with the entire assembly when one man sins? Isn't it interesting? Those who, who have been attacked, Moses and Aaron, who are the ones who've been attacked by the rebels, they're the ones who go to God and say, God, please don't judge them. Yet, isn't it interesting, because Moses and Aaron cry out to God, God relents. When God's anointed leader, when God's anointed intercessor stands in the gap, God listens and God moves. Secondly, look at what happens in verses 48 to 50. So it's the next day. The people come back to Moses and Aaron and they they say, you, Moses and Aaron, have killed the Lord's people. You know, they weren't listening to anything that Moses said because they think it's Moses that did this. And as as a result of that, there's a plague sweeping through the camp. 
Yet Moses says to Aaron, take your censer, because remember that was the job of the priest to hold censers um, in front of God. Take your censer and stand in the gap between the living and the dead in verse 48. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. Why? Because Aaron had made atonement for God's people and for the sin of God's people. And God's wrath, God's anger stopped when that happened. Isn't this amazing? God is angry with his people because they rebelled against him. But his anger is dealt with by the atonement of the priest. The priest who literally stands between God's anger and the people. But note here, the people are still disobedient. It doesn't say that the people have repented or done anything, uh, anything good at this point. God's anger stopping is not about what the people have done. They haven't changed their minds. It's all about what the high priest has done for them. It's not about them being good enough. It's about God's rescuer stepping into the gap and satisfying God's anger with a sacrifice. And this is not an isolated incident in the way that God interacts with his people. This isn't the only time that something like this happens. Actually, this this is instructive of how God acts all through history. God gives judgment where it is deserved, but he also gives mercy where it is undeserved. God doesn't treat his people as our sins deserve. God is willing to show mercy at the slightest provocation. As one man stands in the gap and God relents. We have a whole nation who is rebelling against God here. Yet two people, Moses and Aaron, are faithful to God. And because two people are faithful to God, God lets his mercy spread over the rest of them. I wonder if you can see where I'm going here. You know, this points us to the greatest moment of God's mercy. Where one man took the full force of God's anger at sin and offered himself as the sacrifice for a sinful people who did not deserve it. Christ Jesus offered his life as a sacrifice once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The scene that we have here in in verse 48 of the priest standing in the gap and, 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 and gaining God's mercy for a couple of hundred thousand people is magnified a million times as Christ dies on the cross. As Christ stands in the gap and gains God's mercy for a billion people, even more. We who continue to rebel and grumble and often forget what God has done for us. Christ stood in the gap and took God's anger and atoned for our sin on our behalf. So don't think that you have to sort yourself out before you come to God. Don't think that, well, I need, I need to get these parts of my life in order before I come to God because God won't accept me if my life isn't right. This story proves that God doesn't accept us on the basis of our own lives and the things that we do. God accepts us on the basis of Christ, on the basis of his rescuer that he's given to us. God knows that we can never do anything that would make us right with him. That's why he's provided a way for us to come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. However unworthy we feel, that is the good news. That's the scandalous good news. God isn't looking for good people. God isn't looking for people who are sorted and have their life all right. God is looking for anyone who is going to trust in him, in his way of saving them and not in their own strength. So this story, this this is a difficult story that we have here. It is a story which is very bleak about humanity. 
It shows that we, more often than not, are grumbling rebels. We don't want God as the king over our own lives. We want to be the king ourselves. But it shows that although we deserve judgment, the only hope that we have of escaping it is when God's own son stands in the gap for us and buys back our life, our lives with his life. And so how should we respond to God's mercy here? Well, we should give him thanks. We should praise him and we should live our lives for him. Not trying to make him happy so that he does love us, but accepting that he already loves us and that he already has shown that for us. Let's pray. Father God, we... We thank you that you speak to us through your word and thank you that in your word we learn more of what it means, uh, more of what it means to be saved by you, Lord. In this story, we see that uh, we are deserving of your anger, yet we also see that you are the God who pours out your love and your kindness on us, Lord. You are the God who, who accepts the sacrifice Uh, that is offered on our behalf. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is our rescuer. He is the one who stands in the gap. He is the one who jumps in the way and takes the bullet for us. Thank you that Christ is our savior and rescuer and king. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And we pray that you would help us to love him more and help us to show our love for Jesus through every part of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.